book 18, wherein Achilles learns of the death of Patroclus. Achilles mourns, told of Patroclus' end, when Thetis doth from forth the sea ascend, and comfort him, advising to abstain and from any fight till her request could gain fit arms of Vulcan Juno yet commands to show himself. And at the dike he stands and sight the enemy, who with his sight flies in a number perish in the flight. Patroclus' person safe brought from the wars, the soldiers wash, Vulcan, the arms prepares. Sigma continues the alarms and fashions the renowned arms. They fought still like the rage of fire. And now Antilochus came to Achaeacades, whose mind was much solicitous for that which, as he feared, was fallen. He found him near the fleet, with upright sail yards, uttering this to his heroic conceit. Ah me, why see the Greeks themselves thus beaten from the field and routed headlong to their fleet? No, let not heaven yield effect to what my sad soul fears, that as I was foretold, the strongest Myrmidon next me, when I should still behold the sun's fair light must part with it. Passed out, Menetius' son, is he on whom that faith is wrought, O oh, wretched, to leave undone? What I commanded, that the fleet, once freed of hostile fire, not meeting Hector instantly, he should his powers retire. As thus his troubled mind discoursed, Antilochus appeared, and told with tears the sad news thus, My lord, that must be heard, which would to heaven I might not tell. Nietzsche's son lies dead, and for his naked course, his arms are already forfeited. And warned by Hector, the debate is now most vehement. This said, grief darkened all his powers. With both his hands he rent the black mould from the forced earth and poured it on his head, smeared all his lovely face, his weeds divinely fashioned, all filled and mangled, and himself he threw upon the shore. Lay as laid out for funeral. Then tumbled round and tore his gracious curls, his ecstasy he did so far extend, that all the ladies won by him and his now slaughtered friend, afflicted strangely for his plight, came shrieking from the tents and fell about him, beat their breasts, their tender lineaments, dissolved with sorrow. And with them wept Nestor's warlike son, fell by him, holding his fair hands in fear he would have done. His person violence, his heart, extremely straightened, burned, beat, swelled and sighed as it would burst, so terribly he mourned. Athetis, sitting in the deeps of her old father's seas, heard and lamented. To the, her plaints, the bright Nereides flocked all, how many of those dark gulfs soever comprehend their Glauke. And Kumorike, Spio did attend, Nessia and Kimatho, and Kam and Thitho, Talia, Thoa, Panape, and swift Dinamane, Actia, and Limnoria, and Halia the fair, famed for the beauty of her eyes, Amathia for her hair. Yera Proto, Clemene, and curled Daxemene, Farusa Doris, and with these the smooth Amphinome. Chaste, Galatia so renowned, and Calianira came with Goto and Rithia to cheer the mournful dame. Absudes likewise visited, and Calianassa gave her kind attendance, and with her a gave grace the cave. Nemertes, Mira followed, Melita, Ianesse, with Yanira, and the rest of those Nereides. That in the deep seas make abode, all which together beat their dewy bosoms, and to all thus Thetis did repeat her cause of mourning. Sisters, hear how much the sorrows weigh, whose cries now called ye. Hapless sigh brought forth unhappily the best of all the sons of men, who like a well-set plant in best soils grew and flourished, and when his spirit did want employment for his youth and strength, I sent him with a fleet to fight at Ilion, whom whence his fate confined feet, Pass all my deity to retire, the court of his high birth, the glorious court of Peleus, must entertain his worth, never hereafter. All the life he had to live with me must waste in sorrows, and this son I now am bent to see, 
being now afflicted with some grief not usually grave, whose knowledge and cure I seek. This said, she left her cave, which all left with her, swimming forth the green waves as they sworn, cleft with their bosoms curled and gave quick way to Troy. Being come, they all ascended two and two and trod the on shore, till where the fleet of Myrmidons drawn up in heaps it bore. There stayed they at Achilles' ship, and there did Thetis lay, her fair hand on her son's curled head, sighed, wept, and bade him say, What grief drew from his eyes those tears? Conceal it not, said she. To this hour thy uplifted hands have all things granted thee. The Greeks all thrust up their sterns, have poured out tears enow, and in them seen how much they miss remission of thy vow. He said, Tis true, Olympias hath done me all that grace. But what joy have I of it all when thus thrusts in the place, lost of my whole self in my friend? Whom when his foe had slain, he spoiled of those profaned arms that Peleus did obtain from heaven's high powers, solemnizing thy sacred nuptial bands as the only present of them all, fitted well their hands. Being lovely, radiant, marvellous. A wood to heaven thy throne these fair deities of the sea. Now Silth hath sat upon, and Peleus had a mortal wife. Since by his means has done so much wrong to thy grieved mind, my death in being set so soon, and never suffering my return to grace of Peleus's court. Nor do I wish it, nor to live in any man's resort, but only that the crying blood for vengeance of my friend mangled by Hector may still be stilled, his foe's death paying his end. She weeping said, that hour is near and thy death's hour then thine, which in thy wish served of thy foe succeedeth instantly, and instantly it shall succeed, he answered, since my fate allowed not to my will a power to rescue ere the date of his late slaughter my true friend. Far from his friends he died, whose wrong therein my eyes had light and a right to see denied. Yet now I neither light myself nor have so spent my light that either this friend or the rest in numbers infinite slaughtered by Hector. I can help no grace with which to repair to our dear country, but breathe here unprofitable air, and only live a load to earth with all my strength, though none of all the Grecians equal it, I counsel and counsel many a one. Is my superior that I have no grace gets what I want, disgrace at all? Now then, too soon can hastier death supplant my fate cursed life, her instruments to my indignity, being that black friend contention whom would God might die to gods and men, and anger too that kindles tyranny, and men most wise, being much more sweet than liquid honey is, to men of power to satiate their watchful enmities. And like a pliant fume, it spreads through all their breasts as late it stole stern passages through time. And thorough mine, which he did instigate, that is our general. But the fact so long past, the effect must vanish with it, though both grieved, nor must we still respect our soothed humours, need now take the rule of either's mind. And when the loser of my friend is death in me shall find, let death take all. Send him, ye gods, I'll give my embrace. Not Hercules himself shunned death, so dearest in the grace of Jupiter, even him fate stooped in Juno's cruelty. And if such fate expect my life where death strikes, I will lie. Meantime, I wish a good renown to these deep-breasted dames of Ilion and Dardania may, for the extinguished flames of their friends' lives with both their hands wipe miserable tears from their so curiously kept cheeks and be the officers to execute my sighs on Troy, when, seeing my long retreat, but gathered strength and gives my charge an answerable heat. They well may know, t'was I lay still, and that my being away presented all their happiness, but any further stay, which your much love perhaps may wish, a say not to persuade. All vows are kept, all prayers heard, now free way for fight is made. The silver-footed dame replied, It fits thee well, my son, to keep destruction from thy friends, but those fair arms are worn, and worn by Hector, that should keep herself 
in keeping them. The their fruition be but short, a long death being near him, whose cruelty, glory, cruel glory, yes, they are yet. By all means, then forbear to tread the massacres of war till I again appear from Mulciba with fit new arms, which when thy eye shall see the sun next rise, shall enter here with his first beams and me. Thus to her sisters of the sea she turned and bade them ope the doors of deeps of Nereus. She in Olympus's top must visit Vulcan for new arms to serve her rightful son, and bade inform her father so, with all things further done. This said, they underwent the sea, as self flew up to heaven. In mean space to the Hellespont and ships, and the Greeks were driven in shameful rout, nor could they yet from rage of Priam's son secure the dead with new assaults, both horse and men made on with such impression. Thrice the feet Feet the hands of Hector's sires, and thrice Iases thumped him off, with whose repulses displeased the wrecked his wrath upon the troops, then to the course again made horrid turnings, crying out of his repulsed men, and would not quit him quite for death. A lion almost starved is not by upland herdsmen driven from urging to be served with more contention than his strength by those two of a name, and had perhaps his much praised will if fairy footed dame swift Iris had not stooped in haste ambassad rest from heaven to Peleus's son to bid him arm, her message being given. By Juno, kept from all the gods, she thus excited him. Rise, thou most terrible of men, save the precious limb of thy beloved, in whose behalf the conflict now runs high before the fleet, the either host, fells other mutuali, these to retain, those to obtain, amongst whom most of all is Hector prompt, his apt to drag thy friend home, he paw. He or Paul will make his shoulders, his head forced. He'll be most famous. Rise. No more lie idle. Set the foe a much more costly prize. Of thy friend's value, then let dogs make him a monument. Well, thy name will be graven. He asked, what deity hath sent thy present hither? She replied, Saturnia, she alone. Not high Jove, knowing nor one god that doth inhabit on snowy Olympus. He again. How shall I set up upon the work of slaughter when mine arms are worn by Priam's son? How will my goddess mother grieve that bathe I should not arm till she brought arms from Mulciba? But should I do such harm to her in duty, who is he but Ajax that can vaunt? The fitting of my breast with his arms, and he is conversant amongst the first in use. Of his and rampires of the foe, slain near Patroclus, builds to him. All this, said she, we know, and wish thou only wouldst but show thy person to the eyes of these hot Ilians, that afraid of further enterprise the Greeks may gain some little breath. She wooed, and he was won, and straight Minerva honoured him, who Jove's shield clapped upon his mighty shoulders, and his head girt with a cloud of gold that cast beams around about his brows, and as when arms enfold a city in an isle, from thence a fume at first appears, being in the day, but when they have even her cloudy forehead rears, thick show the fires, and up cast their splendor, that men nigh, seeing their distress, perhaps may ye set ships at their supply. So to show such aid, from his head a light rose, scaling heaven, and forth the wall he stepped and stood, nor break the precept given. By his great mother mixed in fight, but sent abroad his voice, which Pallas far off echoed, who did betwixt them hoist, shrill, tumult, to a topless height. And as a voice is heard with emulous affection, when any town is feared with siege of such a foe as kills men's minds, and for the town makes sound his trumpet, so the voice from Thetis's issue thrown won emulously the ears of all. His brazen voice once heard, the minds of all were startled, so they yielded, and so feared. The fair manned horses, that they flew back, and their chariots turned, presaging in their augurous hearts the labours that they mourned a little after, and their guides, who with percuss of dread, took from the horrid radiance of his refulgent head, which Pallas set on fire with grace, thrice great. Achilles spake, and thrice, in heat of all the charge, the Trojans started back. 
twelve men of greatest strength in Troy left with their lives exhaled. Their chariots and their darts to death with his three summons called. And then the Grecians brightfully drew from the darts the course and heeded it. Bearing it to fleet, his friends with all remorse marching about, his great friend dissolving then in tears to see his truly loved returned so horsed upon an hearse, whom with such horse and chariot he set in safe and whole, now wounded with unpitying steel, now sent without a soul. Never again to be restored, never received but so. He followed mourning bitterly, the sun yet far to go, Juno commanded to go down. Who in his power despite, sunk to the ocean over the earth, dispersing sudden night. And then the Greeks and Trojans both gave up their horse and darts. The Trojans all to cancel called, ere they refreshed their hearts with any supper, nor would sit. They grew so stiff with fear. To see so long from heavy fight, the Achides appear. Polydemus began to speak, who only could discern things future by things past, and was vowed friend to Hector born. And one night both, he thus advised, consider well, my friends, in this so great and sudden change that now itself extends what change is best for us to pose. To this he stands, my command. Make now the turn of our strength. Not here abide, light's rosy hand, our walls being far off and our foe much greater still as near. Till this foe came, I well was pleased to keep our watches here. My fit hope of the fleet's surprise incline me so, but now tis strongly guarded, and their strength increased we must allow, for our own proportionate amends, I doubt exceedingly. And this indifferency of fight twixt us and the enemy, and these bounds we prefix to them, will nothing so confine the uncurbed mind of Iachides. The height of his design aims at our city and our wives and all bars in his way. Being backed with less than walls, his power will scorn to make his stay. And overrun, as overseen, and not his object, then let Troy be freely our retreat, lest being confined, forced our men, twixt this and that, be taken up by vultures. But by night may safe come off, it being at time untimely for his might to spend at random that being sure if next light show us here to his assaults each man will wish that troy his refuge were and then feel what he hears not now i would to hell in mine ear but free even now of those complaints that you must after hear if ye remove not if ye yield though wearied with a fight so late and long we shall have strength in counsel of the night and where we here have no more force than need will force us to, and which must rise, rise out of our nerves, high ports, towers, walls will do, what wants in us, and in the morn, all armed upon our towers, we all will stand out to our foe, to trouble all his powers, to come from fleet and give us charge, when his high-crested horse, his rage shall satiate with the toil of this, and that way's course. Vain entry seeking underneath our well-defended walls, and he be glad to turn the fleet about his funerals. For of his entry here at home, what mind will serve his thirst, or ever feed him with sacked Troy? The dogs shall eat them first. At this speech Hector bent his brows, and said, This makes not great your grace with me, Polydemus, and argue for a treat to Troy's old prison. Have we not enough of those towers yet? And is not Troy yet charged enough, with imposition set upon our citizens to keep our men from spoil without, but still we must impose within, that houses with our rout as well as purses may be plagued. For time Priam's town trafficked with diverse languaged men, and all gave the renown of rich Troy to it, brass, gold abounding, but her store is now from every house exhaust. Possessions evermore are sold out into Phrygia, and lovely Myone. Never been ever since Jove's wrath. And now his clemency gives me the mean to quit our want with glory and conclude the Greeks in sea walls and our seas to slack it and extrude his offered bounty by our fleet. Fool that thou art, be ray. This counsel to no common ear, for no man shall obey. If any will, I'll check his will. 
what our self command let all observe take sappers all keep watch of every hand if any trojan have some spoil that takes his too much care make him dispose it publicly tis better any fair the better for him than the greeks when light then decks the skies let all arm for a fierce assault if great achilles rise and will enforce our greater toil it may rise so to him on my back he shall find no wings my spirit shall force my limb to stand his worst give or take mars is our common lord and the desire of swordsman's life he ever puts to sword this council got a plausible so much were all unwise minerva robbed them of their brains to like the ill advice the great man gave and leave the good since the mean had given they took their suppers but the greeks spent all the heavy even about patroclus mournful rites the leaders leading all in the all forms of heaviness he by his side did fall and his manslaughtering hands imposed into his oft kissed breast sighs blew up sighs and lion like graced with a goodly crest that in his absence being robbed by hunters of his whelps but turns to his so desolate den and for his wanted helps beholding his unlucked for once flies roaring back again hunts the sly hunter many a veil resounding his disdain so mourned Pelides his late loss, so weighty what his moans, which for their dumb sounds now gave words to all his myrmidons. O oh gods, said he, how a vain, how vain a vow I made to cheer the mind of sad Menetius, when his son his hand to mine resigned, that high towered Opus he should see and leave, raised Ilion with spoil and honour even with me, Joe vouchsafes for none, wished passages to all his vows. We both were destined to bloody one earth here in Troy, nor any more estate. In my return hath Peleus or Thetis, but because I last must undergo the ground, I'll keep no funeral laws. O oh, my Patroclus, for thy course, before I hither bring the arms of Hector and its head to thee for offering. Twelve youths, the most renowned of Troy, I'll sacrifice beside, before thy heap of funeral to thee unpacified. In meantime, by our crooked stones lie, drawing tears from me, and round about thy honoured course, these dames of Dardany, and Ilion, with the ample breasts, whom our long spears and powers and labours purchased from the rich and by us ruined towers, and cities strong and populous with divers language men, shall kneel kneel and neither day nor night be licensed to abstain from solemn watches their toiled eyes held ope with endless tears this passion passed he gave command to his near soldiers to put a tripod to the fire to cleanse the festered gore from off the person they obeyed presently did pour fresh water in it kindled wood and with an instant flame the belly of the tripod girt till fire's hot quality came up to the water then they washed and filled the mortal wound with wealthy oil of nine years old then wrapped the body round in largeness of a fine white sheet and put it in then in bed when all watched all night with their lord and spent sighs on the dead then jove asked juno if at length she had sufficed her spleen achilles being one to arms or if she had not been the natural mother of the greeks she did so still prefer their quarrel she incensed and asked why he still was taunting her for doing good to those she loved since man to man might show kind offices through thrall to death and though they did not know half such deep counsels as disclosed beneath her far seeing state she reigning queen of goddesses and being ingenerate of one stock with himself besides the state of being his wife and must her wrath and ill to troy continue such a strife from time to time twixt him and her this private speech they had and now the silver-footed queen had her ascension made to that incorruptible house that starry golden court of fiery vulcan beautiful amongst the immortal sort which yet the lame god built himself she found him in a sweat about his bellows and in haste had twenty tripods beat to set for stools about the sides of his well-builded hall to whose feet little wheels of gold he put to go with all and enter his rich dining room alone their motion free and back again to go out alone miraculous to see 
and thus much he had done of them, yet handles were to her, for which he now was making studs while there their fashion had. Employment of a skilful hand, bright Tedius was come near, whom first farewell had Charis saw, that was the nuptial fear, famous Vulcan, with the hand of Tedius took and said, Why fair turn, fair trained, loved, and honoured dame, are we thus visited by your kind presence? You, I think, were never here before. Come near that I may banquet you and make you visit more. She led her in, and in a chair of silver, being the fruit of Vulcan's hand, she made her sit a footstool of a suit, deposing of her crystal feet, and called the god of fire, for Thetis was arrived. She said, and entertained desire of some grace that his art might grant. Thetis to me, said he, is mighty and most reverend as one that nourished me, when given consumed me, and grief consumed me. Being cast from heaven by want of shame in my proud mother, who by cause she brought me forth so lame, and would have made me away, and then, had I been much distressed, had Thetis and your enemy in either silver breast not rescued me, your enemy, that to her father had reciprocal Oceanus. Nine years with them I made a number of well-arted things, round bracelets, buttons brave, whistles, carcanets, my forge stood in a hollow cave about which, murmuring with foam, the unmeasured ocean was ever beating. My abode known nor to God nor man, but Thetis and your enemy. And they would see me still, they were my loving guardians. Now then, the starry hill and our particular roof thus graced with bright haired Thetis here, it fits me always to repay a recompense as dear to her thoughts as my life to me. Haste, Caris and oppose some dainty guest rites to our friend, while I my bellows loose from fire and lay up all my tools. And from an anvil rose the unwieldy monster, halted down and all awry he went. He took his bellows from the fire and every instrument, locked safe up in a silver chest. Then with a sponge he dressed his face all over, neck and hands and all his hairy breast, put on his coat, his scepter took, and then went halting forth, handmaids of gold attending him, resembling in all worth, living young damsels filled with minds and wisdom, and were trained in all immortal ministry, virtue and voice contained, and moved with voluntary powers. And these still waited on their fiery sovereign, who, not apt to walk, sate near the throne of fair Edithus, took her hand, and thus he courted her. For what affair, O fair trained queen, reverent to me and dear, is our court honoured with thy state? That hast not heretofore performed this kindness, speak thy thoughts, thy suit can be no more. And uh, my mind gives me charge to grant, can my power get it wrought? Or that it have it not only power of only act in thought? She thus, O oh, Falcon, is there one? All that are of heaven that in her never quiet mind Saturnius hath given, so much afflicted as to me, whom only he subjects of all the sea nymphs to a man, and makes me bear the effects of his frail bed and all against the freedom of my will, and he worn to his root with age from him another ill ariseth to me. Jupiter, you know, hath given a son, the excellence of men, to me whose education on my part well hath answered his own worth, having grown as in a fruitful soil a tree that puts not up alone his body to a naked height, but jointly gives his growth a thousand branches, yet to him so short a life I brought that never I shall see him more return to Peleus's court. And all that short life he hath spent in most unhappy sort. For first he won a lovely dame and had her by the hands of all the Grecians, yet this dame Atreides countermands, for which in much disdain he mourned and almost pinned away. And yet for this wrong he received some honour, I must say. Greeks being shut up at their ships, not suffered to the advance, the head out of their bitter stern and mighty suppliants, by all their grave men hath been made, gifts, honours, all proposed. For his reflection, yet he still kept close and saw enclosed their whole host in this general plague. But now his friends put on his arms, being sent by him to field, and many a myrmidon in conduct of him. 
all the day they fought before the gates of Skia. And most certainly that day had seen the dates of all Troy honors, Troy's honor in the dust, Phoebus having done much mischief more, the envied life of good Menetius' the son had not with partial hands enforced, and all the honor given to Hector, who hath prized his arms. Therefore I am driven to embrace thy knees for new defense to my loved son. Alas, his life prefixed so short a date had need spent that with grace, a shield then for him, and a helm, fair greaves, a Cut it such. As my renown thy workmanship and honoured him as much, I sue for at thy famous hands. Be confident, said he. Let these wants breed thy thoughts no care. I would it lay in me to hide him from his heavy death, when fate shall seek for him, as well as with renowned arms to fit his goodly limb, which thy hands shall convey to him, and all eyes shall admire, see and desire again to see thy satisfied desire. This said, he left her there, and forth did to his bellows go, oppose them to the fire again, commanding them to blow. Through twenty holes made to his heart at once, blew twenty pair, that third is coal, sometimes with soft, sometimes with vehement air. As he willed and his work required, Amidst a flame he cast tin, silver, precious gold, and brass, and in a stock he placed, a mighty anvil, his right hand, a weighty hammer held. His left, tongs. First he forged a strong and spacious shield adorned with twenty several hues about whose verge he beat a ring, threefold and radiant, and on the back he set, silver handle, five, Fold while the equal lines he drew about the whole circumference in which his hand did show, direct with a knowing mind a rare variety, for in it he presented earth, in it the sea and sky, in it the never wearied sun, the moon exactly round, and in those stars with which the brows of ample heaven are crowned, Orion, and all the Pleiades, and those seven Atlas got, the close-beamed Hyades, the bear, the surname chariot, that turned about the heaven's axle tree, holds up a constant eye upon Orion, and of all the cressets in the sky, his golden forehead never bows to the ocean empire. Two cities in the spacious shield he built, of godly state, of diverse languaged men. The one did nuptial celebrate, observing them at their um, solemn feasts. Brides from forth their bows, with torches ushered through the streets a world of paramours. Excited by them, youths and maids in lovely circles danced, to whom the merry pipe and harp their sprightly sounds advanced, the matrons standing in their doors admiring, other where a solemn court of law was kept, where throngs of people were. A case in question was a fine imposed on that uh, slow, the friend of him that followed it, and for the fine did sue, which the other pleaded he had paid. The adverse part denied, and openly affirmed he had no penny satisfied. Both put it to arbitrament. The people cried to his best for both parts, and the assistants, too, gave their dooms like the rest. The heralds made the people peace. And the seniors then did bear the voiceful herald scepter sat within a sacred sphere, on polished stones, and gave thy turns their sentence. In the court, two talents, gold, were cast, for him that judged injustice's sort. The other city, other wars employed as busily, two armies glittering in arms of one confederacy, besieged it in a parley, had with those within the town two ways they stood resolved. To see the city overthrown, or that the citizens should heap in two parts all their wealth and give them half. They neither liked but armed themselves by stealth, left all their old men, wives, and boys behind to man their walls and stole out to the enemy's towns. The queen of marshals and Mars himself conducted them, both which, being forged of gold, must needs of golden furniture, and men might so behold they were presented deities, the people Vulcan forged of meaner metal. When they came where that was to be urged, for which they went within a vale close to a flood, whose stream used to give all their cattle drink, they there ambushed them, 
and sent two scouts out to decry when the enemy's herds and sheep were setting out. They straight came forth with two that used to keep their passage always, both which piped and went on merrily, nor dreamed of a ambuscados there. The ambush then let fly, slew all their white fleeced sheep and meat, and by them laid their guard. When those in siege before the town so strange uproar heard, Behind the town their flocks and herds being then in council set, they then start up, took horse, and soon their subtle enemy met, fought with them on the river's shore, where both gave mutual blows with well-piled darts. Amongst them all per perverse contention rose. Amongst them tumult was enraged. Amongst them ruinous fate had her fed finger. Some they took in unhurt state, some hurt, yet living, some quite slain, and those they tugged to damn. By both the feet stripped off and tucked their weeds with all the stream. Blood upon that. Then that their steels had manfully let out. They fired as men alive, indeed, drew dead, indeed, about. To these the fiery artisan did add a new eared field, large and thrice ploughed, through the soil being soft, and of a wealth he yield, and many a man a plough he made. That drave earth here and there, and turned up stitches orderly, at whose end, when they were, a fellow I ever gave their hands full cups of Lucius wine, which emptied for another stitch the earth of the un they undermine, and long to the utmost bound he reached of all the ample clothes, the soil turned up behind the plough, all black like earth arose, Though forged of nothing else but gold, and lay in show as light, as if it had been ploughed indeed, miraculous to sight, there grew by this a field of corn, high, ripe, where reapers brought, and let their handfuls fall to earth, for which some bought bands and made sheaves. Three binders stood, and took the handfuls reaped, from boys that gathered quickly up, and by them armful heap. Amongst these at furrow's end, the king stood pleased at heart, said no word, but his scepter showed, and from him much apart, his harvest bailiffs underneath an oak a feast prepared, and having killed a mighty ox, stood there to see him shared, which women, for their harvest folks, then come to sup had dressed, and many white wheat cakes bestowed, to make it up a feast, he set near this a vine of gold, that cracked beneath the weight, of bunches black with being ripe to keep which at the height a silver rail ran all along and round about it flowed an azure moat to his garden quickest was bestowed of tin one only path to all yet which pressmen came in time of vintage youths and maids that bore not yet the flame of manly hemen baskets bore of grapes and mellow fruit a lad that sweetly touched a heart to which his voice did suit, scented the circles of that youth, all whose skill could not do the wanton's pleasure to their minds that danced, sang, whistled, too. A herd of oxen then he curved, with high-raised heads forged all of gold and tin for colour mixed and bellowing from their stall, rushed to their pastures at a flood that echoed all their throats, exceeding swift, full of reeds, and all in yellow coats, Four herdsmen followed, after whom nine maestiffs went, in head of all the herd upon a bull, a deadly bellow head, two horrid lions rapped, and seized and tugged off, bellowing still. Both men and dogs came, yet they tore the hide and lapped their fill. Of black blood and the entrails ate, in vain the men essayed to set the dogs on, none durst pinch, but Curlike stood and bade. In both the faces of their kings and all their onsets fled, then in a passing pleasant vale the famous artsman fed upon a goodly pasture ground rich flocks of white fleeced sheep, built stables, cottages, and coats that did the shepherds keep from wind and weather. Next to these he cut a dancing place, all full of turnings. It was like an admirable maze for fair-haired Ariadna maid and cunning Daedalus. And in it youths and virgins danced all young and beauteous, and glowered in another's palms, weeds that the wind did toss, the virgins wore, the youths' woven coats that cast their faint dim gloss like that of oil. Fresh garlands to the virgins' temples crowned, the youths' gilt swords were wore at their thighs, 
with silver fortresses bound, sometimes all wound close in a ring to which as fast they spun, as any wheel a turner makes being tried how it will run. While he is set and all out again as full of speed they wound, not one left fast or breaking hands, a multitude stood round, delighted with their nimble sport, to end with true begun, midst all a song and turning sound the sports of come Clisian. All this he circled in the shield, pouring round about, and all his rage the ocean that it might never out. This shield thus done he forged for him such currents as outshined the blaze of fire, a helmet then, through which no steel could find forced passage. He composed his hue a hundred colours tuck, and in the crest a plume of gold that each breath stirred he stuck. All done, he all to Thetis brought, and held up to her. She took them all, and like the hawk surnamed the Ospringer, from Vulcan to her mighty son, with that so glorious show, stooped from the steep Olympian hill, hid in eternal snow.